After our Lord's ascension, of course, we are all waiting now this period as we heard Paul was hastening to Jerusalem if he could be there for Pentecost. And we too desire hastening toward Pentecost because the Lord, His mercy, not only has revealed Himself through His holy resurrection, His passion, through His glorious ascension to the heavens, but now also through descending upon the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Spirit of truth we promised us would reveal to us all righteousness, reveal to us all truth. We would not have to really struggle for these questions anymore, but yet we continue to struggle about all the questions of life. Perhaps it's because we don't simply call from a pure heart enough, come Holy Spirit. St. Seraphim of Sorov says that the aim of the spiritual life, of course, is the acquisition of the Holy Spirit. But to have that Holy Spirit is necessary to have true and right belief and true faith. We hear this gospel passage today, and one of the first things that the Lord tells us is that this is eternal life, to know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. The only true God, which implies there are false gods, which implies there are people, things that claim to be gods that aren't, not multiples, but one, and many things that are false teaching. The Lord tells us, too, that we must beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees. Paul tells us to beware of strange doctrines creeping in and to maintain the traditions that we've been given from before and hold the traditions that he has handed down. So it is necessary, of course, to have right relief. We see the Lord say that he does not pray for the world, but those whom he has been given in the world. So everybody is not necessarily going to follow the right path. Those who continue to follow, those who kept his words, it says in this, he desires the unity of all, but the realization is that the world hates these people. They hated the Lord, and he promises us several things. Not only does he promise us the Holy Spirit, he promises the cross, he promises eternal glory, he promises us his kingdom, but he does not promise us earthly glory. He does not promise us things to be easy in this life. He does not promise riches. He does not promise any of the things that so many of us feel are stocked up in. The fathers of this first ecumenical council, in a time when the church finally had, quote, a time of peace, after Constantine had issued his edict in Milan and allowed peace for the Christians throughout the empire, <coughs> all of a sudden was hit with something very big. Not necessarily physical persecution, even though that certainly did exist, but they were hit with false teaching, with heresy, with the greatest heresy of them all, that of Arius. What is it that Arius taught? Arius said that there was a time when the sun was not. That the sun was not from the beginning. That the sun was not light of light, true God of true God, the only begotten, begotten of the Father before all ages, but was perhaps the chiefest of creation, the highest of creation. It was sort of a rendition of other heresies like adoptionism when this righteous man was sort of taken in by God the Father and blessed and given special powers. It was... Just another rendition of making something God less than God, making Christ less than God. And we remember the words, of course, of Archbishop Dimitri. He constantly would tell us what the most important question we ever had to answer was, was who do you say that I am? He would mention that uh, catechumens would come, or the faithful would ask him things like, what is the purpose of the incense? Why do we have this veneration of the Theotokos? Why the icons? You know, on and on and on. The questions that most of us have. And he would tell them that, of course, the answer to that was, who do you say that I am? Because if you understand who Christ is, all of those things make complete sense. It's nonsense not to have them. That Christ is truly man and truly God. Now, at this council, Arius had begun to spread this propaganda. First, he was condemned by a local council. And then he continued because he had friends. He had allies who were buying into this logic of his. And he was a very logical man from a worldly point of view. He was also a master of propaganda and a master of, if he had the internet today, he would be very, very pernicious because he'd be able to spread it even farther. He would write folk songs to these things. Apparently he was very adept at it. The faithful would sing, get it in their heads, or the unfaithful in this case, and begin to proclaim false teaching about Christ, that Christ was not God. Christ just ends up being some type of great prophet like Moses, maybe a little bit greater than Moses, perhaps a demigod. There's one 
even Origen at times would refer to him as a, a demiurge, as demiurgical powers in which he acted sort of as hands of God, but not being God himself. And Arius ran with these things. And why does this matter? Because as Gregory the Theologian says, what is not assumed cannot be saved. And if he's not God, he cannot raise him up with himself. This ascension doesn't make any sense. It's just a mirage. It is not real. And we are not taken up to the right hand of the Father if he is not true God of true God and light of light. The Father suffered terribly for this. At first, Constantine wanted them just to settle this. He found this peace in the empire, and he thought this was just some dispute between St. Alexander of Alexandria and Arius, which they should have kept to themselves. When he sent St. Posius of Cordoba to go visit, Posius comes back and says, this is not a small matter. This is a pernicious heresy, which affects the teaching of Christ, the teaching of salvation. It is essential that we maintain this teaching for the sake of the church, for the sake of the faithful. And eventually Constantine, of course, calls this council with 318 fathers of the show, as well as some of the heretics, Arius being one of the ones in the bottom of the icon, and there is before you. And they eventually condemned Arius, but this did not stop. This went on for virtually a hundred years, because Arius had many well-placed friends, and this was very powerful. But the Lord did promise that you would be hated for my name's sake. You would be hated because of who he was. And these people were. You see Athanasius the Great, who was exiled five times from his patriarchate, had to hide in a well at points, because he considered himself Athanasius contra mundum, Athanasius against the world. Because it was just him who was fighting for that. Of course, you had St. Nicholas, you had St. Sylvester, many of these wonderful saints in this icon. St. Spiridon, all of them persecuted badly for the faith. But they expected this. And one of the questions, the point of all this, one of the questions that I frequently get, frequently get, and people even who have been Orthodox for a very long time, is why do we still have to suffer for praying? Why is all this harshness in the world? Because I love God. Shouldn't things be good for me? Shouldn't things be easy for me? Question I've never understood. Maybe I was raised a little bit in the way my family taught. But it is a question that many people I've seen leave the faith over this because they're having a hard time. As much as I point out to them the examples of the scriptures that every one of the apostles, every one of the followers of Christ, Christ himself, <clears throat> all of the prophets of the Old Testament, all of the saints suffered mightily. He did promise us a cross. But their attitude is what is different. It's not the complaining. We have St. John Chrysostom's letters to Olympia writing back to Constantinople, speaking of how terrible pain he's in. He's starving to death. He's got disease in his exile. And he always ends up with glory to God for all things. He describes things the way they are and continues to move on. One of the great saints of the church, St. Simeon the New Theologian, who our new bishop, as of throned as of yesterday, wrote, has translated several volumes about Simeon the New Theologian. I encourage you to read them if you would like. He of course, one of the great mystical theologians of the church, I hate to use that word, a great noetic theologian of the church, a great brilliant man of prayer, was able to see things that even Paul speaks about, the third heaven, and spoke about these things very openly. Now, in his time, he had this monastery in Constantinople, and a certain bishop came to town there who was called the Singulos, which was the, for the right hand of the patriarch. And everyone loved Simeon the New Theologian for his holiness, for some of his monks sometimes hated him because he was very strong, and he changed their way of life. The ones that he first moved into their monastery, when he changed everything. They didn't expect real monasticism, and it's exactly what they got. St. Simeon, when this Bishop Stephen, Metropolitan Stephen, moves into the city, Metropolitan Stephen was a man of great renown, great education. Everyone knew who he was, he was brilliant, surpassing all of his rhetoric. But he was a jealous man. This did not make him a holy man because he could speak about God, it made him no new books. But St. Simeon had more renown than he, and he did not like this. Because this was an uneducated man in his opinion. He was a disheveled-looking man, a man who was a great austere, too austere, 
and strict. And he wanted to know what he could do to stop this. He kept trying to trap him into arguments in which Simeon could always come back after a day or two <coughs> written out something beautiful that he could not refuse. Finally, he found his angle. Simeon the New Theologian was known every year for celebrating the memory of his spiritual father, St. Simeon the Pious. He would have a great festival for him. He even had an icon painted of him. This seems maybe perhaps strange to some, but we just look at the recent examples of St. Paisios and Porfirios and St. John Maximovich. There were icons of them long before they were glorified by the church. And services already being prayed at home, certainly. That's what Simeon was doing. So he brought him in to refute him about this. And this is a ridiculous thing you're doing. The church has been blessed if you're scandalizing the faithful. And said, Simeon, said, give me a couple of days. And he would bring him back to a document with scriptures, endless countings of scriptures, endless sightings of the fathers about, you know, who honors me, honors my father. He was given a cup of water to a child, you know, although by, by no means lose his reward. He considered himself giving his cup of water to a holy man. And he went on and on and on with examples from the scriptures of people that honored their fathers. Most of the people agreed with him, but Stephen was not a <clears throat> good man. He kept doing things that were pernicious and trying to undermine Simeon and who people thought Simeon was. And eventually he succeeded because Simeon would not relent. He would not stop doing what he was doing because he knew it was true. And he eventually succeeded in having him exiled to a harsh place. Simeon's an older man at this point. He's beat up. There's no food. It's a very harsh environment. Most of us wouldn't survive. Well, Simeon writes Metropolitan Stephen a letter. I was reading this this past weekend, a week. First, it made me laugh because there's a hint of sarcasm to it. We can't write this way. We don't have Simeon's holiness. We so don't pretend it. But we can learn. We must always stand up for the truth. We must always embrace whatever sufferings you give us. Here's his first letter to Metropolitan Stephen. To my holy master, the most reverend and illustrious Singulus, from your Simeon who is in exile and being persecuted because of you, behold, most reverend master, what grain the fields of your efforts and your words on God's behalf have yielded. See what glory and joy they have granted me, what crowns they have caused me to win, with what happiness they have filled me, for they have led me up to the summit of spiritual knowledge, and have planted the feet of my intellect firmly on the rock, and have even caused me to be clothed in this rock, Christ itself, from which I have the living water actually gushing forth in me, moving and speaking and encouraging me to write to you. This fills me with every delight and renders me completely unaware of the deadly trials around me, like the three boys whom I kept from being, whom it kept from being burned in the furnace. It has thus hidden me in its shelter, preserves me free from grief and misery. For this I thank you, will never cease from thanking you and praying for you. So if you can do anything else to increase the happiness and glory of those who love you, please do not hesitate to do it, so that your reward may be multiplied and your recompense from God, who has set out the laws concerning these things be more abundant. Farewell. Now would you write somebody that was persecuting you in that manner? First of all, they showed great boldness. Tinge mocker. But a lot of thankfulness and a lot of love. Because you can tell, indeed, Simeon was thankful for what he was going for. He had found even deeper measures of grace, a man who had already seen the uncreated light countless times, visions of Christ, a man who was dead, but who couldn't physically move, who, when his disciple was sleeping and woke up, could see him levitating in the air as if laying in a down position praying. This was a very holy man. Well, Simeon, Stephen, of course, was infuriated, wasn't going to leave it at that. He started accusing Simeon of hoarding riches, which as you had seen Simeon, this was not really possible. He barely had a threadbare garment in his body, barely ate. So he had his monastery and his cell torn up, hacking into the wall to find the gold that Simeon was hiding. Simeon finds out about this, and of course it upset him because this was his place of repentance. This was his place of salvation. This was the fiery furnace in which he worked out his salvation, which he became the three youths. His soul meant a lot to him, not in an attached way, but because it had been part of his salvation. He writes back after this, My good master Stephen has once again added more noble crowns to the crowns of victory that I already have. 
How can I repay you for all that you and your goodness have done for me, your humble servant, and for all that you continue to do, and that I know that you will do again? For you have been my benefactor every day for seven years already. How can I make amends to you when you are so zealous in these matters, and know how to endow your friends so beneficently with sweet remedies? But I beg you, do not halt your plans, do not give up your work, add to them, if you will, things that by their intensity will make my sufferings even sweeter. You have increased for me the light, the joy, the sweetness, everything that gushes forth in me in such a marvelous way, and the peace of my thoughts through the ineffable gladness of the Spirit. Please go on increasing these by all means, and continue to do what you do. Unite me more swiftly with my beloved God, on whose behalf I will leave bear everything, because of whom, as you see, I am enveloped by you in the chains of exile. Farewell to my most reverend and holy master, your Simeon, who, because of you, is in exile, stripped of all his possessions. The same tone, with the same joy, that the world will give us persecutions for the truth. That if we stand up for the one true God, the one who is the Son of the living God, as Peter proclaimed when asked, who do you say that I am? The world will not love us. Do you see sorrow in Simeon? No. Do you see joy? You would have seen the same in Athanasius, you would have seen the same in Nicholas, you would have seen the same in Spiridon, and all of the great fathers of that council. So Simeon gives us a great example. Eventually, to finish the story for you, I'll leave you on that, he was brought back to Constantinople because somebody of nobility realized how badly he had been treated. And he was able to establish another monastery. And he was glorified even more strongly than before. And to the contrary, in spite and not letting up in his glorification of his spiritual father, he increased it. Where the vast majority of Constantinople would come to it. Eventually he was glorified along with his spiritual father. St. Simeon provides us with a great example. Despite what difficulties may befall us, we must look to them as the providence of God working in our lives. He desires we all be one. He desires truly we be united with the Father, immersed in the Father, immersed with Christ dwelling in our hearts as his prayer calls for us to have that type of unity with one another as Christians and certainly with God himself. Holy Fathers, pray to God. Amen.